good can you hear me hi handsome i can hear you <laughs> i think we're in i think we've done the magical digital thing <laughs> cool yes thank you for coming everybody um this is ej Here. hello leeds <laughs> hello leeds and hello yorkshire sculpture international and jane and thanks just a quick thanks to you for organizing and supporting such a vibrant and radical and timely piece of performance art hi clay hello <laughs> Hi, um, I feel very lucky to be able to have a chat with you. So shall we, shall we get into it? Yeah. Cool. I want to congratulate you, first of all. It's a, a brave piece of work. I don't think um, anyone particularly likes taking their clothes off in front of everyone, you know, like, um, so, so it's, it's timely. It was incredibly well thought through. It radical in how open and honest it is. I wonder if you might tell us a little bit more about the context within which you created it. You and I have both talked about the fact that there was a recently processed freedom of information request um, for the NHS Gender Identity Clinic, the Laurels, and which is, you know, one of only seven GICs in the country and it has assessed two patients in a year and one person has been left on the waiting list for six years and you've told me as well that in the UK potentially on average it could take now 27 years for a person to get the trans health care that they request so if you're pregnant you might want to register your unborn baby now so that they could possibly get it by the time they're 30 yeah mm -hmm. so so tell me a bit about how this came about this piece and and what sort of political environment you're working in as well as what kind of personal environment yeah so yeah so I was referred the beginning of September in 2016 um, and I kind of shaved my head quite soon after that just because I wanted to it wasn't kind of thought out at that point um, and then I was told at that point there would be about an 18 month waiting list and it was two years, seven months. Um, and, and I had happened to just grow my hair that, that two years and seven months. And I, I was kind of worried because it, it was a bit long and because they asked such bizarre questions, I was thinking, oh, my hair's too long. They're gonna like not give me the treatment because I'm not fully a man enough. Um, but then I was thinking, oh, but I could just say, if they do ask, this is just showing you how long I've been waiting to have this uh, um, appointment. And then I was like, oh, I could, I could make that into an artwork. <laughs> um, and then thought, oh, I'll just carry it on, but didn't think, oh, that's going to be five years almost by the end of it. Wow. Is that how long it was, Clay? Uh, four years and nine months, I think. Mm. Uh, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's five years last week. So, yeah, not, yeah. But, um, Who's counting? <laughs> uh, but I uh, did go privately in the end, um, so it was it was reduced. The time was reduced about two years as well, so it would be about twenty twenty three um, if I'd waited. Um, and so yeah, that kind of was a thing that was an artwork in itself, but also kind of actively giving me dysphoria, uh, and also kind of wasn't wasn't how I felt. I wanted to present myself, um, but I kind of committed to it. And I'm autistic, so you got to keep doing the thing until it's finished. Um, okay, that's, like, that's... Oh, sorry. I was going to say people kept saying you could just stop. You don't need to put yourself through this. I'm like, no, it's gotta. Mm. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, that's that's quite interesting because uh, I was lucky enough to see the performance live in the gallery, and one of the things that I found really powerful about it was that it was transformational in so far as your masculinity was asserting itself as the long hair was coming off. But actually, that made me think about my notions of gender yeah. and how I stereotype gender and how I'm, even as a trans person, susceptible to these conditions within which we frame these binary ideologies around gender. So did, did you find, as you were actually doing the piece, that there was something happening with you about uh you know this this gender transformation within the act 
Yeah, I didn't, yeah, I didn't think about that in the time, but yeah, when you're watching the film and kind of, yeah, how people responded to it, were like, whoa, you turned into a man. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, so I think, yeah, it is really bizarre. And, and that's kind of one of the, the questions when in that one of the clinicians asked was like, is it a big part of your identity, your hair? Um, and they, and it did, and I do really like having long hair, but at the same time, it's these pressures of, that you feel like you have to, like, I felt like I couldn't assert my gender before I'd cut all my hair off. Like that's kind of the first thing that people do when they transition is either kind of grow their hair or cut all their hair off. And it's, it feels mm. like it's the one thing that we have power over that we can do um, that we don't need to go through these systems to get, that we can just do it ourselves. And so, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Do you, do, you, do you think then that this artistry that you've embraced that has since informed your gender awareness, if you like. Do, do you think trans art has a part to play in the gender revolution? Do you think that there is something transformational about, about creativity and producing art that actually could contribute to the struggle for trans rights? Yeah, I think art is important. And I think like even just showing this art, like will probably even raise five pounds for a trans charity doing this. And so that's still uh, a useful thing. Um, and I think it's storytelling is a, is a really important thing that I think we always, we want something tangible, but telling stories and telling other people will create bigger change and um, get people on board in a kind of show this kind of situation that we're all going through. Um, why do you think that's important in, in the current environment that we find ourselves as trans people? Um, I think it's a way of kind of giving ourselves therapy as well, um, that, that I kind of wanted to kind of let this out and um, show something in a tangible way to, to people that might not necessarily understand what's going on. Um, and I think uh, no. What do you think they'll get from it? Do you as an artist a, a, aspire to send a message, you know, like, or you put it out there and just go, okay, we're going to see what happens now? Yeah, I think, and I think like even just, I put a picture on Instagram yesterday and it's gone like, I mean, it's not, it's got 300 likes. That's like, yeah, I, no, I mean, that's a, no, it's, it's a <laughs> but like, yeah, it feels like that's kind of gone somewhere. Um, and that, and that kind of was like a, telling people either kind of give money or talk to people who can change this gender clinic system because it's, it doesn't need to be that. Like, why do I need three appointments? of these really intrusive questions and just bizarre questions for, for me to get healthcare, I should just be able to go to my GP and get that. And we can have that as a process and we're not, no one's pushing for that um, or kind of they are, but not big enough yet. We need more momentum to, to do that because it's just the, what's currently happening is people are campaigning to put money into the system, which doesn't work because they just gobble it up and still see nobody. So um, yeah. I think it's a way of getting people to see how bad it is so that we can then change things on a mass scale. Yeah, and we, and we did have a little bit of a win this week because the Tavistock ruling was overturned, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to tell people, share with people a little bit about that? Yeah, so uh, before you're 18, the only kind of trans healthcare you can get is, is hormone blockers. So that stops you from going through hormone, the puberty that you don't want. Um, and there's a court case at the moment that was that somebody who was a child who went on those blockers disagreed with the fact that they were push, pushed into that or something um, and campaigned for that to stop. So there was a period of time where children weren't allowed any kind of healthcare. Um, and uh, now that's just been overturned. So that will be allowed again, but it will take a few months uh, at least for that to come back through again. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hormone blockers aren't dangerous at all they just pause put a pause button on what's happening so that you can decide later and so and we're, we're all glad that that has been overturned and hoping that that doesn't um, come back again yeah no they, I mean they, it literally was said that this is sort of a, a a really positive move for trans rights in the UK and actually internationally um, but I think that there's there's sort of huge problems surrounding access to trans health and I'm by no means a specialist but certainly I know that 
for example, that there's no service provisions whatsoever for trans men having bottom surgery in the UK. It's just, it's simply not available and it's not been available since May. So there's actually no service providers. So I think what you've raised in this piece for me particularly, feels very much about the importance of having autonomy over our bodies. You know, if, there, if there's one thing that we should be able to maintain control over, and this I, I think for me very much aligns with feminist ideas surrounding women having control over their bodies as well and makes me makes me again see a connection between the feminist movement and the trans rights movement you know as opposed to a divide that in actual fact this is again talking about having control over your own body you know that this is a fundamental human right and so the way that you've displayed it in in this piece i found incredibly touching because it was so vulnerable and so personal and yet it really spoke to me because there were so many parts of the experience that I felt myself kind of going through again with the voices surrounding you and this this constant media hype that surrounds our lives and I guess I wonder whether or not you you find that your art gives you a way of cutting through that noise? Does it provide you with a space that that is is your own? Mm. Yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of the art I make is kind of just in, in response to my, my own feelings and not necessarily how people have been putting it on me, but kind of thoughts of my own thing. And, and, and yeah, trying to, at the beginning, wondering whether I want a top surgery in the first place or if I was just being like pressured into it by society. So I think making work has always kind of been that kind of therapy of like working out what I actually want and um, kind of taking casts and looking at it and be like, no, nah, that's not it. And then uh, giving, so I've got various casts where I've cast my body and given my body top surgery and then so I can look at it and be like, mm, wow, that's that's it. Um, and, and so I think, yeah, it's, I don't, I tried not to get involved in what the media is doing because I know that it's all bullshit. So um, yeah, kind of keep away as much as possible and just get the periphery and just try and think more about what, what is, is relevant to me as a person and, yeah, and that body autom autonomy of, of that. Um, I find that really interesting that it's, that it's a process for you, mm. you know, that it's almost a a thinking through making space that very much aligns with you know the remit of Yorkshire Sculpture International as as as, as an organization as well you know this idea that 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 crafting and, and making and sculpting and shaping is is in itself a form and a process that provides a unique set of experiences and answers you know mm -hmm. do you think it was important do you consider yourself to be a Yorkshire artist yeah um <laughs> yeah i think i think especially kind of leeds has a very big kind of trans community in that kind of um and also a big turf community um so it's it feels kind of relevant to to be in in that kind of space and um to be making work in a kind of radical way that is coming from authority within within yorkshire um but yeah and i think um the landscape also plays quite a big role in in my work but not always necessarily as as like a conceptual point but more of a I really like being in the landscape and that's kind of how I'm positioning myself and using that as a gallery space almost um so it's not yeah it's not always like let's go in the the moors for like reasons it's just I want to go in the moors and I make art so they have combined <laughs> themselves that's really nice. It's really nice to, to hear you reflect on that. I think it's so important to think beyond, you know, when, when we think of sort of transness and we think of art and we think of radical and we think of progress and politics and so forth, it's so frequently located in the South, you know, it's so often London centric or it's New York centric or, you know, and in actual fact to, to talk openly and to see openly that there's really radical work being made that's informed not only by personal experience but by place mm -hmm. i think there's something very beautiful and empowering for people beyond these particularly urban capital spaces and that's really important i was lucky enough to work on the west yorkshire queer stories project 
Mm. And, and it was, you know, stretching back decades and decades and decades of radical queer activism in the area. And it feels very important to have these conversations, not just because it broadens our awareness of what transness is and what our experiences are collectively, but it also helps other people in the area feel confident about taking the steps they want to or coming out or so it's nice to hear that you connect with the community there I know that you've got plans for what you want to do with your hair and the scalpel you use do you want to maybe share them with the audience yep so uh so the scalpel I asked the surgeon if I could have the actual scalpel he used but he said no because he's a killjoy um <laughs> So it's uh, it's the same brand and shape as this as the sur surgical scalpel, but yeah, it's just a new one. Um, so I wanted to put that in the Museum of Transology with with the the hair, and I've also got the the breast tissue that was taken that's been preserved at the moment. So that's kind of go go into the Museum of Transology as well. Um, and I'd quite like to kind of have them as a like a Duchamp like ready made scotch in a box. So that's going to go around and ex exhibit wherever we'll let you exhibit human flesh, which is not many places. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's really important to kind of have this history and archive this history because it's yeah been kind of what Jane was saying at the beginning is just been destroyed and hidden throughout our whole, our whole history um and like every time someone builds up a big archive or space where they have a lot of that information it's it's been destroyed with like the institute of uh, sexology in in berlin that was kind of just all burnt to the ground and that had so much information about how to do hormones and various surgeries and that that's thing and so it, it always feels like we're constantly being hidden so i think we and we're not always being put into museums or collections um, of, from the curators and archivists themselves. So we have to then just do it, do it ourselves. So I keep everything that I ever do, and I write on the back of photos, "We're gay," this and uh, this this is our pronouns, and so that people kind of they're like, "Oh, we don't know who they were. They should have been friends." Whether it's <laughs> um, just kind of very explicitly anything that I keep that and I print out pictures all the time so that it, we have like a physical archive of queers that existed um, and I think that's really important because people aren't doing that um, and uh, it's places like Museum of Transology and other um, archives that are in the Bishopsgate Institute have, are really good at trying to get that history but um, but we need to do it ourselves as well because our families aren't always going to keep that information in the way that they'll keep information about the rest of their family so I think what would you like to see someone do with it in a hundred years time oh I don't know because I also don't like the idea of the breast tissue living longer than I live so okay I'd... now we're getting into really <laughs> interesting stuff I don't because... wanna, like, yeah I don't want to be dead and then they'll still be here um <laughs> So I have the vague idea of that it will that, that element maybe will be destroyed on my death. But um, what is know. it that makes you makes it okay that it's available now? Then I don't know. I think it's. I mean, I don't. I still don't like it that it exists. But I think, I think it's if that's the like the thing that is left when I've gone, then that that kind of feels like doesn't represent me as a person at that point because it's mm. it's not it's it's pretty it's the opposite of who I am um so why is it important now I don't know I thought I, I I didn't want to throw it away in case I wanted it in the future so just mm. To, mm. to have um and I think I think I might change my mind about it being there when I've died but but um yeah I think now you'll be dead yeah well <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, when I'm old, if I get old, if, if we haven't all died by climate change at the well then, but um, yeah. It's, it's interesting. So, so the way that the Museum of Transology is designed is that everything comes with a tag attached to it and it's in your handwriting and it's your story and you are the curator of your of your contribution right so there's not one curator of the museum of transology but there's 400 and something right and growing and so i think the idea with that was that when for those of you who are archiving nerds in the audience 
when when we archive it, there's part A and part B of the same archival number. So they can't be separated, right? They're one and the same object in a way, or at least the tags live as an object. So you can write on the tag that goes with the tissue, <laughs> this doesn't represent who I am. Yeah. And you can also put into the the agreement, the donation agreement, that on your on your death they're to be disposed of. Yeah. For example, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole idea is that as people who have had our autonomy robbed so so very often and quite and often over and over and over again as trans people through our lives, in actual fact, the Museum of the Transology is the place that you can feel safe and you can be assured that <laughs> however you want this story to be told, a curator in a hundred years' time is not going to be able to come along mm. and rewrite your story and go. Some people had their boobs chopped off. <laughs> ha, ha, ha. They can't do that, right? Because the stories will exist mm -hmm. with the object. And I think that's actually the power of it is that we're writing our voices back into history, yeah. not only our artefacts. Mm -hmm. So I want to assure you that we will work very hard <laughs> on getting that, that, that agreement really, really specifically correct, Chloe. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Cool. Hey, darling, I, th I think it's a fantastic piece of work. I was really moved by it. I was, I was super, super moved by it. I'm very glad to be here to talk with you today. Shall we see if the audience would like to ask you any questions as well? Yeah, so you're welcome to ask EJ as well if you have um, anything to send, yeah. First of all, that was really powerful and emotional. I don't know any other words to describe it. Um, I was gonna ask a question about the hair, but you answered that. Um, <laughs> did you just ask the surgeon really nicely if you could keep the breast tissue? Yes. So f just for EJ, they said, uh, did you ask the sur surgeon nicely um, to get the tissue? Um, so EJ's tissue is also in, in the Museum of Transology. So maybe they'll answer this as well. Um, yeah, I did ask and he just said no completely. Um, and then I said, well, I'm actually working with Yorkshire Sculpture International and the Henry Moore Institute uh, and, <laughs> and uh, they've asked for it. So and then we're like, OK, fine. Um, <laughs> so so we did. I, I had to pay for a courier to take it from the, the hospital to the um, the place where it was being preserved because because human tissue, you need a certain license to, to be able to have it in your possession. So um, yeah, they made us pay for that. Um, and then we, yeah, but, but otherwise, yeah, it was, it was easier than I, I thought it would be because um, they usually uh, cut it, cut, sorry, this is too much, <laughs> cut it into bits and uh, check for cancer in, in kind of, and then just incinerate it. So I had to sign a waiver saying that I am happy to not be checked for cancer. But other than that. Hey, um, things have changed a little bit since when I did it. When <laughs> I did it, I, we did have to sign the waiver, um, but I didn't have the institutional support that you had. And you raise a very good point by saying that, because yeah. in actual fact, by, by partnering with, with institutions that have kudos, cultural kudos, um, we can progress our work much further. It's really important to have that support. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in, back, in, back in the day, I couldn't go and pick them up because I, I was working away at, at that stage. And so my girlfriend had to go up to the hospital and sent me, sent me a text saying, well, I've just walked out with a bucket in each hand, with a boob in each hand on the way home, and literally <laughs> just picked them up. Um, but we did have lots and lots of complications about displaying them when they went on display at the Museum of Transology exhibition at Bright Museum and Art Gallery. We had to put forward um, a request to the trustees it had to be and again there's these sort of these internal blocks you know that potentially people who weren't trans could have decided as to whether or not they go on display or not whereas you know it was actually our exhibition and equally we had to uh, investigate whether or not um, uh, the legality of displaying human remains of a living human. So that was another ideological challenge as well. So there were some complications, but I think by and large, if we ask, we can get them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I asked quite a few things that you said. I asked if they could film it and they said no um, and record the audio and they said no. I thought it'd be really, f I don't know what audio would have been, but like, <laughs> just like. <laughs> Um, but I think they'll probably just put the radio on when they do it anyway. Um, um, and then I asked if they could take a print 
of of and he didn't do that but um, i've got photographs during the surgery um so the kind of big open wounds on my chest as well uh, and then a picture of the nipples just on their own on the table which is like the transitional period of like is it allowed on instagram like because it's not even on a body yeah. <laughs> like, um uh, but they because apparently they take your nipples off they're there for about three hours they said so or two two or three hours just hanging out so yeah that like <laughs> purgatory <laughs> um what were we talking about <laughs> ask the audience if the audience want to ask any questions oh yeah has anyone else got any questions uh, yeah no. um, i don't know if you would have asked them but did they ever give any reasoning for like the super invasive like surgery like questions that didn't really make any sense because like when i've spoken to other people who've had top surgery they've said like don't say you can never have sex like yeah. don't say this so it's like even though we are being seen for healthcare that's meant for trans people trans people still have to lie to cis people mm -hmm. in order to get that healthcare which yeah. doesn't make sense well, so that was about uh, whether you have to answer all the questions that the GIC ask you and if they kind of, why they ask you such bizarre questions. Um, yeah, and they kind of said at the beginning of the meeting, you don't have to answer everything, but then you, yeah, you don't know which of the questions, if you don't answer, if they're going to be like, oh, no, you didn't actually get the high enough marks in the trans test. Um, mm -hmm. So you kind of... It's, it's, it's just a power move really. And that's kind of the questions I've got are kind of more standard ones, but I know people who've had like physical examinations and really intrusive, horrible things. Um, and um, yeah, it's just, you just, you're, you're trying to get this healthcare and you, you don't know if you say no, if that's, that's saying no. And so, yeah, it is, it is kind of, yeah. When, when that's kind of one of the things where they're like, can you have penetrative sex? And I'm like, yeah, probably. They're like, oh, that's interesting because someone last yesterday said no. And you're like, oh no, I'm fucked up. Um, and so yeah, it's it's a really bizarre place. And it's it's not always like I think there's that privately they don't ask as, as many questions, I think. And um also there's there's new GICs at the moment that I think are also a bit less, but they obviously have a standard set of questions because in that there was three different appointments uh, I don't so some of the questions were the same questions by two different clinicians and so they obviously say if you look in the mirror what would you look like and that's on there they like have to say that question but yeah bizarre things like what's your dad's name like I'm like <laughs> and that was kind of they kind of said that at the end of the first Penis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like what what do they want and then they'll ask you questions in a way that is like they have, they're asking, like when they said, what do you want from a future relationship? That what they were asking was, do you want to have kids? And do you want us to do gamete storage? But they didn't ask that. So I was like, I don't know, uh, have a partner. <laughs> and like, was just talking and they were like, oh no, what I actually meant, do you want kids? And it's like, well, why didn't you just ask that in the, in the first place? <laughs> yeah. And they were like, and then kind of they said, what do you want out of the service? And I'm like, I want top surgery and maybe hormones and maybe bottom surgery. We can talk about that later. But then they like, tell us about your genitals right now. I was like, well, why do we need to talk about that? Like, that's not, I've told you what the things that I want and that's not one of them to talk about now. But then they just keep doing it. So yeah, it's, it is, and yeah, I, this is why it should be a self-led thing that you just kind of say, I want this and I am an adult and have an informed consent and can make these decisions for myself. I don't need to tell you what I played with as a kid, but it's... Yeah. And then the irony of them enforcing like gender roles onto you as a trans person. Like I had a friend who had to take a friend along and then they asked a friend like, um, the person I identified as a trans man, and they asked a friend like, do you wear makeup? Like to the friend and they were like, oh yeah, they wear makeup sometimes. <laughs> and then they were like, oh really? And then the friend was like, and then the friend was like, like kind of like David Bowie. Oh, sorry, AJ, do you want, do you want relaying this? That wasn't really a question, it was more of a, just GICs are terrible. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, Hans, or did Hans go? Oh, that's all right. They did have a question. <laughs> but does anyone else? Rob, yeah. 
So yeah, so I've got a project, I've got an exhibition opening in Blackpool next uh, Friday, um, but I have I kind of went out being like, I'm not going to do anything traumatic, I'm just going to make like some cement blobs, so that's what that, it's kind of a combination of things on the Blackpool beach and then also the arcades, so there's like 2P machine, like 2Ps and shells and seaweed and rocks and bits of plastic and we've just these blobs at the moment so I'm hoping that they look good they're not quite finished but we'll see um and then uh yeah the gallery that I run in my house in uh, Slawit, a little village near Huddersfield um I'm putting on an exhibition for uh Huddersfield Contemporary Music Festival so there's a uh, five artists so Ro who's here is in that um and some other people um so that's running in the middle of November. So if anyone wants to come, then keep an eye on my Instagram, which is Clay Bowler. <laughs> Have I got anything else? There is more things, but there'll be an exhibition kind of about this some point, maybe. That's not really allowed to say yet, but there'll be something. <laughs> anyone else? Yeah. Hello, me again. Um, when you were doing the audio, like for the live performance, mm -hmm. so did we did we just watch what the live performance was with the? How did you get the timings right? Yeah, so so in the original performance, the audio was coming out of four different speakers around surrounding the audience. Um, so so each voice had its own. So it was kind of more engulfing. Um, uh, and then, so this this audio was a combination of that and also a live recording of the in the space. So I had had a bit more reverb and also, I mean, you couldn't quite hear it, but there was people giggling and things with the uh, and kind of that sound of of things. So we were possibly trying to make it in this space, but it kind of felt more relevant to to not recreate that that audio work. Um, and yeah, I didn't edit the film, so I'm not sure how they managed to move that, but there was. I have I have the file like all on its self as well, like with all four coming out in stereo. Um, I was yeah, making it up as I go along. <laughs> but because I just panic if like that you'd end up hearing it too fast and then you wouldn't get to like. Oh yeah, yeah. I kind of because I'd listened to it so many times. I knew and I went too fast at the beginning and I was like whoop and so then I started cutting like really short bits that I kind of wasn't too long and then ended up cutting the back of my head which yeah you don't see on this but um and then yeah kind of I just because I'd listened to it so many times I knew when it was going to be and I was like okay time it now so it did end in the same way that it ended so it was perfect in my head I thought that you'd never listened to the audio before no yeah I made the audio so I knew that one yeah I had to listen to these these appointments about I think 12 times at least so yeah it wasn't I was like why have I made this work I'm just so that's why we're doing concrete blobs so <laughs> because I don't want to listen to my another GIC appointment <laughs> Yes. This is a slightly self indulgent question. Can you talk about the importance of using trans voice actors? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, so as uh, yeah, Leo was one of the the actors and yeah all of them were kind of and most collaborat collaborators part, as part of the project were trans. Um so yeah, I think with the audio it was specifically I wanted kind of us to take ownership of those questions um and kind of the, and and you can kind of hear the spite, especially in yours. You know, like, <laughs> that like kind of we know that we've all been asked these questions, and you're kind of having we're like shouting them back at at the the gender clinic. Um, so I think that was that was really important. Um, and and I just want to pay trans people because we need money to pay for our hormones and things like that as well. So it's always important to do that. Is that you know? And thank you for your voice. <laughs> yes. Hi, um, I'm Rob. Um, yeah, um, you mentioned trauma. Um, so I'll bring this up. But I think it's quite a feminine thing to talk about when talking about trans work and how trans work is often positioned by institutions and the galleries for us to kind of present that trauma. Um, and earlier on in the talk, BJ, you were talking hinted at catharsis um, 
at how you know doing this as a transformational act. Um, and I'm just wondering about what what else it does. Um, because in my mind, there's something else it does. It goes beyond that. It goes beyond the past. Um, in the same way that transition itself, whether it's social or medical, it creates a future. Mm -hmm. And I think not only does this piece display time, like it displays physical, actual time, you and the many other people have to wait for access to healthcare, but just through the act of actually displaying that, it, it grabs a hold of that future and like forces it into the now. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't a question, I'm really sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was like trying to work out how I'm going to relay that. <laughs> I think that give yourself more credit than it being catharsis, like I think it does more. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Rose said it's not just catharsis and therapy, <laughs> it's it's more than that. It's like grabs people. <laughs> I can't remember the beginning, I've got ADHD, but thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, I guess it's a, it's a question for both of you, um, but um, I was just thinking about like as trans people, interacting with cis people where people are really curious about the process of transition and like, you know, you're wandering around your everyday life and people will be asking you inclusive questions and I'm wondering how it feels to kind of take that process and put that on a stage and you don't know who the audience is going to be mm -hmm. like how does that feel <laughs> cool so uh, jess said oh wait, what did you say so uh, how <laughs> how we we have to deal with uh people asking us questions all the time like this not just in general clinics like um just random people we meet just ask you about hormones and surgery and like how does that feel to put this work and like show those kind of questions without knowing who the audience is going to be or um how do we um is that right <laughs> um so they, they said you can answer as well if you wanted to say anything um i don't know yeah i think it it maybe it shows people what bad questions are in this specifically in this one kind of people don't I think people are always worried that they're going to say the wrong thing and then end up saying the wrong thing because they're too worried about it or um I get a lot of questions about how well I recovered I think that people I think that's that's the thing that I've decided is not um intrusive but they're like oh so were you like in bed for a week I'm like I don't understand I got that question like from about five different people that are like, oh, I could talk about that. But so yeah, I think it's 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 maybe this shows the questions that are bad, but also um maybe we should make something where the questions shows them the questions that they're allowed to ask as well. <laughs> so that uh yes, I'm not sure. Did you want to say anything, EJ? It was when the Museum of Transology has been on exhibition with all the objects in the collection um on display. And I've been in the gallery and visitors haven't known that I'm the curator, one of the curators for it. And I've been able to hear their comments and them talking and what they're saying and what they're unpacking. Um, I could sometimes I felt myself feeling extremely vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And at other times I felt myself being angry and defensive and wanting to jump in. But I think museums and spaces that show art in a way are kind of sacred spaces that enable people to explore perhaps things they don't understand but they're willing to learn about away from the noise of the outside world so I didn't want to jump in I wanted to respect that space where they were working through coming to terms with it and being allowed to ask those quest stupid questions without feeling like they were in trouble for it, you know, without feeling like they had to watch or clip their own language. And so I'm, I'm more interested in people feeling like they can ask questions that I have the patience to respond to rather than closing them down. Or, you know, and, and sometimes I would see there was 
one family, they were, they were Dutch, a mother and some children, and they came in and the children were quite young and they went to the cabinet that was the bathroom cabinet and it had packers and other, other objects that people used to shape their silhouettes and, and so forth. And these kids were asking about them and this mother was enacting where they would use them and how this person would shape them. Like she was just so willing to engage with the object, the conversation, the children, the narrative, and to explore it with them. And for me, this was one of the most powerful moments of the exhibition because it was about finding this space to have these conversations really naturally and really openly. You know, you can't expect everyone to know what trans is just like this. Certainly you can't expect them to rely on the media for, for, for you know, well-informed information. Um, so in actual fact, if it's about us putting our voices back in to this story making and this, this narrative and this storytelling, then um, I think that we should probably encourage people to feel like they are able to engage as openly as possible, as draining as it may be. And I guess that one of, one of the things about taking that draining element away is enabling more of us to feel like we can contribute to this conversation, that it doesn't just rely on a couple of Instagram trans superstars, you know, that actually everyday people with everyday lives are also trans and are, are, are part of this conversation too. And so I think bringing in these worlds that are the cultural worlds, you know, that we can have more input into and more, more control over the creative expressions that we want, that we want to offer around our experiences um, is incredibly valuable when we're trying to compete with, you know, cultural ministers that are, that are you know, out, out about being transphobic and homophobic, you know, our new cultural minister, you know, when, when we've got lawmakers that are trying to shut us down, when we've got health providers that, that won't give us any health provisions, they literally don't offer the services. I think we need to rely very strongly on our arts and heritage sectors to, to give us the space to answer these questions on our own terms. Cool, yes. <laughs> I think we'll finish there because um, my mind is gone. But uh, yes, please donate to the, the code that is on the, the chair. Um, and if you want to hang around a bit after and ask me questions not in front of an audience, that is also nice. <laughs> Cool. Did you want to say anything or is that the end? <laughs> cool. Thank you all for coming. Um, yes. That's Thanks, Clay. Thanks.